I suppose allowing the public to make uh, you know, stock purchases themselves is, is a well-established business, right? People have been doing that for decades, and it really hadn't changed an awful lot up until the time that Robinhood appeared on the stage. That's right. What convinced you that the timing was right to launch? So uh, to be honest, we thought that this would be a good product. We thought we would use it ourselves. We knew that there was a need for it. But you can never really be sure until you actually have that market validation, until consumers are, are actually saying they want your product, they're excited for it. Um, and I still remember the first time we put our website that announced Robinhood. This was about a year before Robinhood was available to the public. But we put our website up and kind of explained what it was. We had a little bit of a Q&A. And it was in testing mode. We had no idea anyone would find it. We didn't do anything to promote it. And we put it online maybe like 8 PM on a Friday evening. So everyone goes home. Uh, I wake up Saturday morning. Um, and I open up my laptop. I had Google Analytics on our site uh, open. And I saw something like 500 simultaneous visitors to the website, which was a really huge number for something that we didn't promote. We thought baseline would be like six or seven. But we saw 500. And we dug in a little bit deeper. And I saw that a lot of those were coming from Hacker News. And I click on Hacker News, and I see, number one, Google acquires Boston Dynamics, which was a robotics company. Number two, China lands spacecraft on moon. Number three, Robinhood free stock trading. Okay. I was like, all right. It's pretty good that we're number three. No way we're going to jump ahead of the Chinese landing on the moon. Um, but 20 minutes later, there we were, number one, ahead of the moon landing and, uh, and uh, Google acquiring this robotics company. And I'm calling my parents, telling them, wow, what we have, people are actually excited about. For the first time ever in my life, we have this sort of f feeling that customers are interested in the product. Um, and then after about 10 minutes, we realized, wait a minute, nothing's ready. People that are signing up aren't getting email confirmations. Some of the image assets were like horribly broken. People were getting 404s. So the entire team rolls out to the office on Saturday to uh, basically make the biggest mistake from a PR perspective, which is launching your company on a Saturday. It's like the one thing that they told us never, never to ever do. But, um, yeah, we were very fortunate in a way because we sort of had the win at our backs from the very beginning. Um, we had something like 10,000 people sign up uh, on the first day, 50,000 the first week, and then about a million uh, over the first year while we had our wait list. And all of that was basically organic, which is pretty much unheard of in our space. I mean, the entire financial services industry pretty much grows on the back of paid advertising, Super Bowl ads, online ads, billboards. And to have that kind of growth pre-launch um, and post-launch really driven entirely by word of mouth um, was quite amazing. So uh, apologies for the really long-winded answer. But um, yeah, the, you can never really, really know how people will respond to a product um, until you kind of put it out there. And we were very lucky that uh, we put it out there and people kind of wanted it right away. So, 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 so given that incredible growth that you witnessed, um, albeit with a chaotic start, I guess, yeah. wh why do you think that nobody has introduced zero, um, zero commission trading as a competitor to you? Uh, well, I think it's very difficult from a, a couple of different perspectives. One is that we're in a regulated space. So we have to have a compliance department. We have to go through a process. Um, we, were, we were operating in, from the standpoint of the regulators for about a year before we could even announce what we were doing. So in today's market of kind of instant gratification, especially in entrepreneurships, where you kind of imagine like the weekend hacker putting together a website or an app and launching it to the public um, the next Monday, it's, uh, it takes a very surprising amount of perseverance mm. to be able to knowingly enter a venture where 
you have to wait a year before seeing any sort of results. So, so, so given that, 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 that long wait time, right, so you need a little bit of grit and resilience and, and, and a good bit of foresight to do that. Yeah. How, how would you advise maybe some financial services or fintech students who are, who are looking at this space to approach it? How, how, how would they cut their teeth, I guess, without having to wait for that year of talking to lawyers, which nobody likes? So first of all, I don't recommend anyone offers free trading. It's been done before. It's a very hard space. Um, I think it really helps to have some knowledge about the space before diving in. So if you're just out of school and you've never worked in a financial company or you've never worked in an insurance company, I don't think that it's a great idea necessarily to start an insurance company. Could be wrong about that. Maybe you went through some sort of very personal experience where you learned a lot about insurance. but. Um, if you're just like going through the flow chart of these are like the largest industries that have yet to be disrupted by smartphones or computers and kind of making your way down and you pick, pick something in financial services, even though it looks very compelling, um, that's not the approach that I've seen work. Uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs that have done well uh, have a very sort of personal pain point or experience in the space. So, my co-founder and I started uh, a previous company in the space where we actually serviced institutions, banks, and hedge funds rather than individuals. And through that experience, we realized that it's possible to offer trading for free. Institutional customers are trading for free. And we asked the question of like, why hasn't this technology made it over to consumer yet? And that was sort of the, the inquiry that led to the idea that Robinhood could even be possible. But we would have never realized that or realized sort of the process between taking that idea and putting it live on the market uh, if we had just zero experience with financial services. So, so during, during the year when you were working with the, the, from the legal perspective, what was the, the balance of advice that you were getting from, from, from the lawyers and the, the regulatory professionals in terms of don't do this, it'll never float, or people saying, yeah, it could possibly work? Yeah, um, a really, really big piece of advice that we got early on was to not become a brokerage, um, which is kind of the, the standard sort of logical advice, right? Um, and people told us that because they said, well, um, it's hard to become a brokerage. You're regulated. You have to deal with compliance. Um, it's going to take a year. It's very expensive. And the value in what you're presenting is all in the front end. So work with another brokerage, slap a, a shiny front end on it, and that's like where all your value is. And our approach was a little bit contrarian because we came, from, um, we came from a background where we built back-end technology, and we realized that the difference between sort of rolling your own and white labeling, labeling some, someone else's is huge. Um, if you white label someone else's technology, you don't have control over how things work, and then you have a customer asking you a question, and you have to like redirect it to a vendor. Um, so that actually ends up increasing your cost of servicing a customer and um, makes it very, very difficult to offer something like free trades. So um, yeah, I think that was one decision that we made early on that was contra what we were hearing that um, ended up paying huge dividends over time. Talk a little bit about hiring, um, and particularly how that hiring has, has evolved from when you were in that early stages until now, particularly given you know, for, for a FinTech fin services play, you're yeah. trying to convince well-paid individuals from, from the banking and the regulatory space to join this, this crazy idea. How, how have you approached that? Well, actually, um, there are some exceptions, but the vast majority of uh, the people we hire are software engineers. So we're competing less with like um, the big banks and more with companies like Google, Facebook, uh, the, large, the large tech companies. Um, and that in and of itself has been not the easiest thing. Um, when we were small, it took a lot of sort of uh, scrappiness. You know, we would spend a lot of time as co-founders with every recruit. Um, you know, we would take them out drinking. We would just really not give up until we got them to convince to join. 
and a lot of the people, a lot of the people that were our first hires were friends of ours. So um, even with that, it was very difficult. Um, is, is, is drinking a prerequisite for working in infant services? No, 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 it's not. Um, not at Robin Hood, but, uh, but yeah, we pulled out all the stops. We gave people the hard sell, um, and you know, every hire in the early days was uh, a huge challenge that took a lot of personal commitment. Um, we would go to the career fair at Stanford to recruit people, and we actually still do this. And my co-founder and I are, are actually at the booth, you know, meeting meeting the students and trying to convince them to join. And um, that's actually one thing I really enjoy, so I kind of still do it. But those are kind of the things that you have to do to compete because it's an advantage. You know, Uber's not going to send their CEO to the career fair to talk to candidates. They have like recruiters and you know probably teams of university recruiters underneath there. So you have to do all of these little things that other companies won't do um, to get those hires. And we've been fortunate that over time, as people have heard about us more, it's, it's gotten a little bit easier for us. But in the early days, nobody's heard of your company. Nobody trusts that you're going to be successful. So you have, to, you have to really spend a lot of time and effort. Um, this question from the audience. Are you planning on adding other derivatives? Uh, on, onto the platform as well, like foreign exchange? Yeah, so the, the thinking behind this is we want to start with something that um, the largest group of consumers want, and that was uh, US stock trading. Um, everyone pretty much trades stocks, invests in stocks, and 95% of the people that make investments are, are doing it in stocks. So that was kind of where we started. I think over time, it's sort of natural that um, we'll add a lot of these other assets that our competitors offer. But the priority has been to sort of tackle the largest customer pain point first before we get to some of the premium features that more active investors are interested in. So on those premium features, do you foresee that the revenue model is going to be different for you know EFTs versus Forex, or, or is it, are you planning the same? So um, we offer ETFs right now. Um, the, uh, those are free. Uh, we do have a paid product called Robinhood Gold, which we released, and it's been tremendous. Um, yeah, lots, tons of people have been signing up for it. And uh, that starts at just $10 a month. So we've been generating uh, the bulk of our revenue through that. Question here about um, the this was the user experience. Why have you not released a browser-based version of this? Why do you still exclusively use the mobile interface? Yeah, and this is a request that we've gotten a lot. A lot of people are interested in a browser interface, um, and we focused on mobile initially because um, it was we just didn't see very many compelling mobile products in our space, um, and we really thought that it was a great use case that was underserved. So there are a lot of existing providers that offer entirely reasonable web products, but the products for mobile were very, very crappy, uh, to put it mildly. So that was a good place to start. Um, we're working on offering a great uh, web experience as well. We're not going to release it until, um, until it's really, really great. And that's sort of been our um, our strategy for anything that we release. Did, did you create a specific marketing strategy to target, call them the millennial audience for that mobile experience? Um, I think we ended up with a very compelling marketing strategy, but we didn't call it that because we don't actually have a marketing team, um, which is really, really unique considering the the growth that we've seen, but that growth has been entirely organic. You know, we recently announced that we hit 30 billion in transacted volume on the platform in a really short amount of time, and then um, passed 1 million user accounts, which we announced uh, last year. So all of that has been entirely organic. Um, so we rely on customers loving the product so much that they talk about it to their friends, and then their friends sign up, which is, um, 
which is in some ways very simple because it combines marketing with product. The better your product is, the better the marketing is. Uh, you, you, you mentioned Robinhood Gold there a minute ago in terms of that, that, that premium model. How, how were you funding yourself up to that point? Was there any revenue generation or was it entirely through, through, through venture and debt? Yeah, so we generated some revenue before through um, customer cash balances, reinvesting customer cash. Um, but yeah, Robinhood Gold was uh, a huge step function in terms of our revenue. Question, how, how do you manage to penetrate a highly regulated space uh, and any recommendations for entrepreneurs facing similar challenges? Yeah, uh, my biggest piece of advice is to understand your space. Um, I don't know if that's possible without, without actually being experienced or having some sort of experience in your space. Um, I'm sure some have done it, but with, with us, it was the case that we understood our space very, very well. Um, and I think you have to have a lot of grit and tenacity to be able to persevere through the regulatory hurdles, especially early on. I mean, it took us around a year to get our regulatory approvals and licenses to even be able to talk about our business. So um, be aware of, of that process and sort of uh, um, willing to take the chance that, you know, it might take a lot longer than you anticipated before you can actually bring your product to market. Did you, and on that, did you find that the conversations that you were having with investors in those early stages was very focused on, well, this is heavily regulated and, and these are the challenges you're gonna focus? Absolutely, and I mean, a lot of people were skeptical. They, they were concerned that we might not get the approvals. Um, and, and actually, it was kind of a interesting story. You know, we had sort of a, a deadline where we had to show that we had enough capital to run the business without any reven revenues for about a year. And um, you know, we were just a little bit short and we didn't wanna have to tell the regulators that oh, we need an extension for this. So um, the day before we were to have this, this meeting, um, our chief compliance officer's wife went into labor. So, um, it was very fortuitous timing because then we, we delayed it because of that. And then that gave us sort of an additional couple of weeks to, to scrape some, some amount of funding so that we ended up uh, meeting our goal. So it was literally through like the skin of our teeth that we, uh, we got Robin Hood approved and off the ground. I'm glad somebody finally asked this because I wanted to ask it at some point, but how, how did you meet Jared Leto and Snoop Dogg? Um, we met Jared, we met Snoop Dogg through Jared Leto, and we met Jared Leto through, uh, I believe it was Aaron Levy, okay. who's another investor. Aaron, Aaron from Box, right? From Box, yeah. yeah. Do you interact with them much? Do, do they come and ask you about the stock market? Do you, uh, do you advise Snoop on his stock trading? That'd be cool. I'm not allowed to advise, uh, advise people on their stock trading. Um, compliance reasons, but uh, yeah, they, a lot of our investors come out and hang out and meet the team and uh, you know, offer feedback about the product and our business. Um, actually, Linkin Park, the band, is also an investor. And you're just, you're just showing off now, I mean, seriously. <laughs> these are, these are tro trophy investors to you, right? Not well, actually, I bring that one up because uh, Mike Shinoda from Linkin Park we have a phone call and he's telling me about how he got passionate about stock trading. Um, and he was uh, an early Apple investor, not early, but mid nineties. It was the first stock that he bought right before Steve Jobs came back. And, you know, he believed in the iMac and the other products so much that he kind of knew that uh, it was gonna be worth much more than it was at that time. And I think that experience that sort of magical feeling that you get when you believe that a company is gonna, gonna do well and then you buy the stock and you become an owner is the same sort of feeling we're trying to capture with our customers because that's how I got interested in investing. It was through, not through thinking about my, my retirement or um, my 401k or um, investing in a mutual fund, but it's through buying stock in a company that I really believed in. And that was sort of my gateway into the world of investing. Uh, 
uh, just going back to um, to some of the revenue, um, some of the question on, on, on your revenues. Commission and transaction fees make up 20-30% of revenues for the incumbent competition. So uh, what what's the other 70-80% and, and, and have you an opportunity to tap into that as well? Yeah, the other 70% are things like interest. So they earn interest on customer cash, uh, margin lending. I mean, if, if you think about it, um, what a brokerage is and what it looks like is very much like a bank with the additional functionality that they store shares and they allow you to buy shares. So they hold assets much like a bank does. They can lend them much like a bank does. Um, a few of the larger brokerages have even become banks. So you have Charles Schwab and E-Trade that are essentially banks. So they have access to the conventional ways that banks make money. So this question here, Schwab lowered its commission two weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, so what's stopping them from going to the floor? Did you guys see what, what happened to their stock the day they lowered their commission? It dropped over 5%. So, I don't know, Schwab's maybe uh, 50. That's a short-term response to, 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 uh, to you know, a tactical move. You know, are, are, there, are there, I don't know. Well, I, I, it's not just a short-term response. The reason that response happened was because that's going to flow to the bottom line, right? That's just uh, people are predicting fundamental changes in their revenue. So, even though it's only 20 to 30%, if you think about this as a $50 billion company, 20 to 30 percent, you know, that's that's 15 billion dollars. It's not a not a trivial amount of money. So it's very, very hard to justify getting rid of that in one fell swoop. Um, it really hurts them. So, um, yeah, going to going to zero is going to be difficult and will take a very long time. And I think our strategy is um, offer more products that customers care about, um, iterate at a really quick pace, and you know, in five to ten years, I think at some point people will no longer be paying trading commissions one way or another, but people will also have access to a, a ton of other products and services through Robinhood. Just, just on, on the product, it's a great question here, because you mentioned earlier on that the team is largely made up of an engineering staff, but um, the, the, the UX is, is obviously very important. Someone is, is, is making trades and they want to feel comfortable and they want to make sure they're not going to make a misstep. So how, right. many, how many designers do you have on the team and, and how important is that design function within the, the company? Yeah, we have a um, handful of people on, on the product design team. The team is um, purposefully small because we believe in the power of small teams. Um, working together, especially on the design side. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, they work very, very well together. They do, uh, we have a user research team as well, which goes out and talks to, talks to actual users, tests ideas. So we've been growing the team, but we've always had a focus of having the people that make product decisions be a tightly knit group of people. Make, make, makes sense. Um, any any missteps along the way? Any mistakes that you uh, that you want to share, or that you would have done differently as you grew the company? Um, I think Robinhood had a very very unique trajectory. The team had a unique trajectory, and um, you know everything that we've done, where we are today, is due to um, due to those events. So um, one thing I mentioned in my talk over at the Fox Theater is that in our previous company, we were very sort of hung up on the idea of trying to do as many things as possible. So we thought of ourselves as kind of the Bell Labs. Uh, so building all sorts of technology that we apply to different use cases, building chat bots, building all these things. And you know, we'd, we'd heard the advice that if you're spread too thin, you can't, do, you can't really do a good job of one thing. But I think if we hadn't viscerally experienced it ourselves, um, yeah, we, we, we probably wouldn't have done such a great job making Robinhood as simple as it is. Our instinct would have been, let's cram as many features as possible into this, into this app because you know, people have a need for, for different things. Um, and that probably would have, would have missed the mark. 
So that, that's about all we have time for. So I'd like to, uh, to wrap up now and thank Vladimir for his time. Can we get a round of applause, please, for Vladimir Tanev from Robinhood. Thank you. That was fun.